वो बाद में जब आएंगे तो दे कैन यू नो लेटर टेक देयर पार्ट Yes, sir. Let's have now. Let's start. Yes, sir. So, good morning to all the participants who have joined from the various institute from Delhi and Haryana state. Uh, on behalf of NAC, on my personal behalf, I welcome you to this important webinar in light of NEP 2020. To begin with the program, I request uh, Dr. Jagannath Patil, sir, advisor NAC, to please welcome uh, the participants and the speakers today, sir. Patil, sir, please. Thank you, Indra ji. Uh, let me join my colleague Dr. Sham Singh Ginda, Assistant Advisor, Dr. Vinita Sahu, Assistant Advisor at NAC, and Dr. Pratibha Singh, Deputy Advisor at NAC. Uh, I, Dr. Jagannath Patil, on behalf of Northern Region Team of NAC, and on behalf of our Director NAC, welcome all the delegates for the webinar today, which is meant for the states Delhi and Haryana. And it is my great pleasure to welcome on board uh, uh, today's keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Rana Singh, the Vice Chancellor of Sanskrit University, Mathura, whose introduction in detail will be made by Indra Singh Ji soon. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, very soon we will be joined by the today's chief guest, Dr. Hemant Verma, Deputy Director of Higher Education, Haryana, and also we will have Dr. Vikas Gupta, Registrar of Delhi University, with us as the guest of honor. And uh, uh, perhaps I will join a bit uh, in adding few points on behalf of NAC at the end, uh, if time permits. So uh, this is the list of panels today, and uh, we will have also question and answer session at the end. We will try to finish the program by 1 p.m. The focus, as you see, is on the NEP uh, and its implementation and role of NAC in it. What NAC is doing in terms of NAP implementation? What are the expected things uh, higher education institutions uh, supposed to do uh, in coming days? And how NAC has made efforts to integrate the NAP related aspects. Uh, so that is the focus. And that to about the six parameters that you will uh, come to know from the speakers that they are going to talk today. So without uh, much further ado, I welcome once again all our experts and all the delegates uh, for this important webinar today and looking forward to the presentations of the day. Namaskar. Thank you, Patil, sir, for a brief, warm welcome to the participants and giving a gist about of today's webinar. Uh, today we have also Professor Dr. Rana Singh, the Vice Chancellor of Sanskrit University and the CEO of Sanskrit University. Uh, with due permission, Professor, I'll just take two minutes to briefly introduce the participants about your uh, brief uh, CV. Dr. Rana Singh is currently uh, uh, working as the CEO of IIIE of Sanskrit University, Mathura. He is a techno business professional having over two decades of experience in the domain of academics, research, training, quality assurance, accreditation, entrepreneurship, and consulting. Professor Singh is the former director of Army Institute of Management Technology, Greater Noida. Earlier, he has also served as a director of institutional effectiveness at University of Jazeera, UAE. Dr. Singh shifted to UAE in the year 2012 to provide training to banking, finance, and insurance professionals of UAE on the invitations of Emirate Institute of Banking and Financial Studies, the only institution promoted by the Central Bank of UAE. Thereafter, he has worked as an uh, assistant director with Gulf Medical University, director of institutional research and planning. Sir is an MBA gold medalist with specialization in finance and PhD in management. He also has a chunky experience in setting up and providing private universities and technical institutions approved by national international regulatory bodies on a working basis. He has been pioneering excellence in the domain of strategic planning, implementation, and control to enhance the overall effectiveness of higher education institutions to enhance the quality of teaching, learning, and assessment. Sir has also authored books on Know Everything about the corporate social responsibility, the CSR case studies also. And to the benefit of the participants, he is also the co founder of www.indiacsr.in, the Indian's largest web portal in the domain of CSR. And he has been pioneering excellence in the domain of CSR, including various aspects of planning, implementation, control of CSR programs, and focus on regulatory companies. Uh, with due respect, sir, we welcome you to this important webinar. It will take the entire day to go into your CV in details. May I now kindly request you to please brief all the participants. 
with your vast knowledge and experience on the topic that is NEP 2020. Over to Dr. Rana Singh ji. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sham Singh Indaji. Uh, a very warm good morning to one and all. Honorable, honorable uh, advisor, sir, Dr. Jagannath Patil. Honorable Dipti advisor, ma'am, Dr. Pratibha Singh. My colleague, uh, Sham Singh Indaji and uh, Dr. Vinita Sahu, madam, assistant advisor, and uh, our guest today, Honorable Director from Higher Education and uh, esteemed uh, registrar, sir, from Delhi University. All the participants and uh, attendees, a very warm good morning to one and all. It's indeed a pleasure to be part of this event, and at the outset, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to all the members of NAC who wonderfully conceptualized this event. And I'm sure the mission, vision, and the action plan, which the entire team of regulators, especially NAC and UGC and other regulatory bodies, which are sincerely joining their hands together, would go a long way towards accomplishing the envisioned goals and objectives of our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji, who has really taken quantum leaps towards uh, ensuring the thought process of conceptualizing the national education policy and its implementation. So we'll start with the initial thoughts and then we'll come about the various imperatives of the national education policy. Now, the major orientation of the higher educational institutions and universities is to understand what has been the vision of the national education policy. Now, when we talk about the national education policy, well, there have been series of transformational initiatives in the yester years and the decades to Radical, to radically transform the higher education domain of the country. Now, one of the most uh, sought after thoughts, as well as the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister and our Honorable Education Minister, both of them, is to see Indian higher educational institutions and universities you doing mean. excellently well in not only in the Indian context, but as well as in the international context, and to deliver its best in terms of the output, both in form of research and innovation. And we wish to see the Indian universities to be doing excellently well in the top notch, among the top notch rankings, in the rankings given by QS rankings, Times rankings, higher education rankings, and various other international rankings of the world. Now, the agenda is to provide access, equity, and quality of education. When we say access, equity, and quality of education, the agenda is to take it to the last mile of the Indian population, which is almost 138 crores, 1.38 billion, which we talk about. The second major vision is to focus on improving the teaching learning assessment process with technology tools. Now, when we say technology-enabled mechanism, we have to focus on impacting the quality of teaching and learning of the students as well as of the faculty members who are lifelong learners. Now, we also talk about the major agenda, which is slightly different. In the ancient Indian education system, we had Shastrarth. Shastrarth was a process wherein two learned people tried to prove who has more knowledge. Now, there has to be a transition from knowledge dissemination towards knowledge creation. When we talk about the aspect of knowledge creation, the intent is to focus on world-class research facilities, amenities, and infrastructure, and to motivate the faculty members to focus on creating new set of knowledge to be imparted to the students from India and abroad. Now, the next agenda is also to focus on Capacity building and competencies. Well, internationally, there has been a transition when we talk about outcome-based approach, outcome-based learning, and competency-based learning. So there has to be focus on capacity building within the universities to make sure that we make the universities competent enough to create 
globally employable workforce which can deliver the optimal blend of knowledge skills and competences to the students and to make them globally employable workforce with the right set of competencies so that they are industry ready right from the day one last but not the least the focus is on research outcomes now when we talk about research outcomes well gradually traditionally we have seen in india and abroad we focus on the continuation of research we focus on well these are the research findings which have happened in the past and we continue the research to add to further research findings i remember some 20 21 years back i had the opportunity to meet the then vice chancellor of, of manipal university sri b m hegre sir he said let us motivate the researchers to focus on refutative research so that the challenge the existing research findings so that we are able to create some new research outcomes so the agenda is to motivate all the universities and higher educational institutions to focus on delivering new research outcomes which become globally acceptable and more so they should be applied and we should focus what has been their impact in the social life and how we are going to apply those research so the entire vision of national education policy in terms of research and innovation is to focus on strong social impact and which can transform the society in leaps and bounds and which can help the academic fraternity in terms of leapfrogging and getting an exponential rate of growth now we'll talk about the other aspects which our uh, national education policy has focused at i'll just i'll take a minute to reshare the slide again one moment please just a moment yeah i'm resharing the slide once again yeah the next agenda is to focus on strategic planning now let us try and understand what is the aim of strategic planning and internationally there is a culture of data driven strategic planning empirical strategic planning now it's important for us to do and conduct a strategic and to prepare the strategic plan for our universities and higher educational institutions and the focus is to have strong international and global networking so that they can help us in terms of leveraging the mutual competencies of higher educational institutions and universities of india and abroad so global networking is going to give us the exponential rate of growth in the process of dissemination of knowledge as well as in creation of knowledge and imparting of skills and competencies to the future budding talent so the strategic alliances with leading corporates from india and abroad as well as with universities will give a catalytic boost to the qualitative and quantitative dimensions of the delivery of higher educational academic processes now it's also emphasized to have technology enabled learning now when we say technology enabled learning the global pandemic has given us a lot of opportunities and challenges to help our universities and higher educational institutions to get to the next level so that we are leveraging technology to provide world class knowledge skills and competences to our indian students as well as to enable the faculty members to enrich their individual teaching abilities knowledge and skills e content has started getting a paradigm focus and now we have to focus on the resource based learning and we have seen a lot of indian institutions especially in form of nptel and inter internationally we have coursera we have lot of other web portals which are helping the students to learn from the open courseware ocw which we talk about 
Now, when we talk about research collaboration, it's going to provide us a fundamental strength with the help of leading researchers of the world, as well as we are going to leverage some of the advanced research facilities from leading Indian research focused institutions and universities, as well as international universities. There comes the focus on demand driven program. Now, Internationally, as well as in UAE, where I had the opportunity to work for six, seven years, we used to conduct need analysis. So need analysis was a project wherein the institutions and universities were required to conduct a survey and conduct an empirical research, which has to focus on conducting a project to analyze whether or not the academic program which we are going to launch is required to be launched or not. So it used to have a structured questionnaire from academicians, from HR managers, from alumni, from higher education uh, stakeholders, as well as from uh, stakeholders from the industries. So all these stakeholders used to give their feedback and their empirical data, as well as empirical data used to be taken from various universities what were the demand and supply gap? What was the ratio of number of applicants? What was the quality of placements of the students who passed out? So on and so forth. The more agenda has more emphasis has to be laid on launching programs and sustaining those academic programs which have more demand in the market, which has which is producing more employability to the students. The major focus also has to be on the strong an active industry academic interface. Well, I was blessed to be part of CII, FICI, PhD Chamber of Commerce, and the uh, Delhi Management Association on almost all the industry forums to be part of the industry academia interface. And uh, we have been conducting series of meetings of people from academics as well as people from uh, the industry to come together and to share their thoughts, views, and ideas what are the major structural changes which are required in the curriculum? What is required in the pedagogy? What are the various aspects to be taken care in the process of academic delivery? And how we can maximize the process of the accomplishment of outcome-based education means how we can achieve the goals of outcome-based education. Now, here is the era our Honorable Prime Minister has been talking about Startup India, Make in India, and a lot of emphasis is going in terms of technology based incubations. A couple of days back, I had the fortunate privilege of being at Bangalore, wherein we had a very long meeting with our Honorable Vice Chairman Niti Ayok Sri Rajiv Kumarji, who was talking at length how technology can be a transformer of the economy, how technology can radically transform the way we are delivering academics, education, and how we can focus on creating world-class employable workforce and make sure that Indian students are by and large one of the best internationally. And how we can focus on more and more technology incubation. So the focus is on creation of more and more startups and to strengthen the startup ecosystem, the incubation ecosystem, accelerator ecosystem, as well as the commercialization ecosystem. So the higher educational institutions and universities have to focus more and more on structuring new startups from the campus. We all know Google was a startup from University of Stanford where two PhD scholars, they joined their hands together. And today it's one of the world's top-notch technology organization giving and moving the whole world in terms of the quality of features and services it is offering. The technology incubation has to be a major focus in the times to come by the institutions and universities in the times to come. Now, let us understand the education imperatives. Well, time and again, lots of uh, academic thinking about the skills and knowledge, the process of imparting skills and knowledge, the optimal integration of the latest and contemporary pedagogy is very, very important. Now, when we are saying Knowledge and skills both are important. So the focus is on more and more experiential learning, where the students are able to le learn by doing. Now, 
when I talked about needs analysis, the academicians and the program coordinators, HODs and deans, they are required to conduct a academic an academic review on completion of the program, and we do to what extent the program learning outcomes were accomplished, and then we have to analyze the gap between what the academic program has delivered and what the employers were looking for. So we have to analyze the gap between what we have delivered and what was the expected product from the employers. And then once we analyze the gap, we have to bridge the gap by updating the curriculum and integrating the required set of knowledge, skills, and competences in the next curriculum, which we update and make sure that it completes the process of due diligence in terms of going through the Board of Studies, Academy Council, and other bodies as per the requirement of the university as but it's the statutes and ordinances. Sure, we have to focus on the quality of academic delivery in all higher educational institutions and universities so that we are creating globally employable workforce with the right set of values and the right set of skills, including soft skills. And we have to focus on making them employable and making them worthy citizens by giving them the optimal set of values. Now, we have to focus on the key behavioral skills. When I say key behavioral skills, in India we talk about the 16 sanskaras of the Hindu mythology. So the students should have the right set of behavioral orientation so that they treat people with respect and dignity. And they become, they bring name and fame to themselves, to their alma mater, to their district, to their society, as well as to their state and the country. Making sure it is very important for us as academicians that in the process of teaching, we have to help the students apply the concepts effectively. Learning and the rote learning has to become obsolete in the times to come. With immediate effect, we have to focus on helping the students learn how to apply the concepts and how they can analyze the situation, apply the learnings, and provide solution. The so problem solving skills has to be really given a high level of high degree of importance. It's important for ensuring that we as academicians, we are imbibing high level of understanding among the students. Now, when we say high level of understanding, it's important for us to understand that the students have to understand and not to mug up the concept. If they understand, they would never forget. And there has to be a difference in their learning approach. We have traditionally a lot of emphasis was in terms of mugging up the knowledge. Now the focus is to make them understand, apply them with some real world problems and to focus on bringing innovation in all sets, innovation in the process of research, innovation in academic delivery and to leverage creativity to make the teaching learning process interactive as well as engaging. When I say interactive, we have to keep on interacting with the students, keep them engaged in the process of academic delivery. I hope uh, I'm able to convey because what really happens, if we don't engage the students, the students become slightly you know, lethargic in the process and they may lose interest in the topic. Now, excellence. Well, it's very, very important for us to understand we as academicians and we have to focus on achieving excellence in the three processes teaching learning and assessment so to make sure whatever we are teaching and whatever the students are learning they have to achieve excellence in the process getting the best blend of knowledge skills and competencies last but not the least we have to also focus on achieving research excellence innovation excellence incubation excellence commercialization excellence and we have to focus on the talent transformation process now, when we talk about talent transformation process, we may not have one size fit all. We have diverse learners in the class. There are some slow learners, some medium paced learners, and some fast paced learners. We need to focus on creating a talent transformation plan to one and all and make sure that the diversity of students does not come in between the process of learning based or what we talk about. Learning outcomes means maybe the students who have strong pace of learning they may be able to achieve the outcomes, learning outcomes at a faster pace. But we have to also focus on ensuring the students who have 
the slow pace of learning, medium pace of, of learning, they are also able to make sure that they are able to achieve the envisioned uh, course learning outcomes and program learning outcomes. Now, let us look at the paradigm shift in the pedagogy. Earlier, the major focus was on behaviorism, but now we have made a transition towards cognitivism, constructivism, and metacognitivism. Now, there is more focus towards understanding the cognitive aspects of learning. We all know that when we talk about perception, perception is a cognitive process, which focuses on input, throughput, and output. So earlier, the approaches of academic delivery was teacher-centric. Now it has to be towards the learners, and it has to be made learner-centric approach. That's why when we write the outcomes, the course learning outcomes, we start writing on successful completion of the course, the student would be able to. Earlier, when the approach was teacher-centric, we used to write the objectives. The objective of the course is to. So that's where the transition has happened and how the curriculum and the course learning outcomes and program learning outcomes are also changing. Now, in the learner-centric approach, when we write the program learning outcomes, we write on successful or completion of the program, the student will be able to dash, dash all the program learning outcomes. Similarly, for the course learning outcomes, when we write, uh, we started writing on successful completion of this course, the student will be able to and we start writing the individual uh, course learning outcomes. So earlier, the focus was individual learning. Now the focus is on cooperative learning, collaborative learning, participatory learning, and we give more and more team-based assignments. Earlier, the focus was on expository learning. Now this is the orientation is moving towards discovery learning. And earlier, the <clears throat> learning approach, now it's moving towards the nonlinear approach. Now, when we talk about the shift in the pedagogy, the major focus in modern times is to focus on making sure that we are engaging the students. We are engaging the students in such a way that the students are able to engage themselves and they are able to make sure Uh, sorry for the moment. I think there's some hitch in the slide. I'll just. Uh, okay. I'll share it once again. Just a moment, please. Okay, so now we'll come to the major focus of the new education policy. Now, the more emphasis is on development of the creative potential of the individual. Now, creative potential of the individual, I mean both in terms of the faculty members as well as the students together. Now, we have to focus not only on the cognitive capacities like literacy, numeracy, and higher order thinking, but we have to also focus on the critical thinking problem solving ability of the students and how they are going to apply the problem solving ability with real life problems and then the focus is to make sure that the students after getting education they have a tool in their hand to the tool in terms of helping them to make sure that they have to solve the economic problems, they have social mobility, as well as they have to focus on making sure that the students, after getting the education, they are able to achieve the economics, social mobility, inclusion, and equality. Now, the focus is to make sure that we make the academic delivery in such a manner so that the slow learners, medium-paced learners, and the fast learners all are able to accomplish the envisioned 
learning outcomes of the course and the program together. And we also make sure that the education has to focus on the local needs as well as the global needs. Now, when we talk about local needs and global needs, we make sure that definitely we have certain uh, aspects of we have certain aspects of academic delivery which has to make sure that uh, the education becomes able to serve the requirements of the local community as well as now apart from this uh, we as academicians we have been talking about the academic bank of credits and now when we talk about academic bank of credits most of us we have been uh, focusing at ensuring that well whatever students are learning as their uh, academic achievements in a semester well UGC it has focused on establishing the academic bank of credits and this is a virtual entity it will be keeping the record of all the students currently pursuing higher education in the Indian education space now it was launched by our honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji on July 29th under the national education policy so there has been four major focus areas which we talk about freedom and flexibility in the university degree granting system so the students will have the freedom they can take breaks between their academic terms uh, means if it's a four year program they can take a break after two years and pursue the academic program after doing a job for another two years and they can move to any other university they can carry their credits the standardization with in the higher education system sure that all academic institutions in higher education and university domain would have standardized programs with some common benchmark of credits and there'll be the robust integration of the higher education system which will focus on delivering world-class knowledge skills and outcomes with structured credits for all the students in every semester so this is towards this is a quantum leap towards internationalization of Indian higher education which would be aligned with other international universities which have semester based system as which and they have the credits of every course in every semester so this is going to enable the Indian students to get their credits in the academic bank of credits which can help them move within the Indian context as well as towards international organizations so it gives them an opportunity to complete their academic programs after taking single or multiple breaks so this has enabled those students in a big way in terms of how to focus on how to focus on pursuing their programs without without uh, getting any hindrance now when we talk about the academic bank of credit it has really enabled the students in manifold ways now when we talk about how it has helped the students in manifold ways the students are now able to make sure that they can select the best courses earlier they had limited options to select the courses now they have multiple options to select the courses suiting their aptitude and their quest for knowledge so they are having more and more focus of electives from their own discipline and sometimes from some other discipline as well so this has become a very very important and advantageous aspect now these choices to the students will help them to pursue courses of other disciplines as well without facing any logistic problems as well as without paying much of extra fee so it is to help the students with mobility of moving between institutions while pursuing one degree but also is offering them flexibility of leaving a course and rejoining it after some time so they can leave it after one year rejoin it after serving corporate sector for two years and so on and so forth so this is going to make our educational system more and more vibrant and flexible accessible for the students now this is important for us to understand that how academic bank of credit is going to make the life of students simple as well as flexible in terms of their overall learning approach now when we talk about academic bank of credits it's also important for us that uh, 
we as higher educational institutions we are going to offer the students a digital bank which was earlier available only for uh, you know the cash segment in terms of now this is this is going to act as a digital bank a digital repository of the students wherein they can see all their they can see all their achievements in terms of uh, the credit the credits which they have achieved from different universities one or more universities they'll be able to see in one digital bank at a common dashboard and it helps the students in manifold ways it's going to bridge the disparity earlier the higher educational institutions and universities were offering a high level of disparity in different programs so there'll be some level of standardization and it will bring uniformity in the various degrees and the students will have the liberty to change their academic institution after one year or two year as well as they can take breaks between their academics because of uh, financial reasons or because of some other reasons maybe after two years they have developed some research interest they can conduct research for another two years and come back and finish their academic program later so it will reduce the pedagogical gap which is currently existing between different higher educational institutions in india and last but not the least now indian higher educational institutions as well as universities are now becoming internationalized in terms of the cultures and practices of academic delivery so it is very important for us to understand that yes when we talk about making sure that indian institutions are doing much better in terms of their overall academic delivery and so on we have to also make sure that our programs become internationally acceptable and the students get their global advantage for the same now it will be the academic bank of credits it will be responsible for opening closing and validating the academic accounts of the students now when we talk about when we talk about uh, the academic credits every student every student will have a bank account of his or her own and this bank account will be having an opening balance a closing balance and this will do the validation so it will make sure that every student has a validated document in his uh, digital form so that the process of you know validation becomes easier now the students all these credit verification some whenever students used to go for higher educational initiatives the credit verification will become a lot easier all the students they can accumulate their credit and get awarded in form of a degree they can have easy credit transfer from one program to the other from one academic institution to the other and it will help the students in manifold ways sometimes the students they have been doing uh, various courses from the open uh, online mode as well as the distance mode like from the swayam portal and ptl portal and so on so the students can make sure that the credits which they have learned from these portals they can bring it to academic bank of credits and these academic programs have also been allowed earlier it was 25% now it has been uh, upgraded to 40% so in the process of academic delivery the higher educational institutions and the universities can incorporate the online learning as well as uh, other similar aspects from swayam and ptl or other mooc mooc's uh, courses to an extent of 40% it's going to be a great help to the students in the times to come now the validity can also vary based on the subjects or discipline students can redeem these credits so whatever credits they have earned they can redeem it and maybe they can get awarded in form of a degree at the end of 2 uh, 3 years so for a student who has ac accumulated 100 credits which is equivalent to say 1 year they can decide to drop out do some job in the corporate world and come back and they can redeem their credits and seek admission in second year at any other university so it makes sure that the students are able to get the flexibility and sometimes the validity of 7 years 
so they'll be able to finish their programs within seven years so which is a reasonable degree of flexibility to the students now when we talk about other similar initiatives which has been uh, propounded by the new education policy which we also call as national education policy now the agenda is very very important for us to understand that yes we have the new national education policy and the validity the validity of uh, we were talking about the academic bank of credit is seven years so it has been envisaged to make sure that uh, the academic programs offered by different higher educational institutions and universities are likely to maximize the benefit to the students and they make sure that the academic mobility of the student is reasonably high from one institution to another from one university to another from one country to another by giving them proper credit transfer and ultimately enabling them to get a degree diploma or a postgraduate diploma according to the number of credits earned by them so it's important for us to understand that yes the academic bank of credits is going to radically transform the current culture of finishing the whole program in one go to and from one institution like currently we have seen when people do not get good quality services from a telecom provider they have the facility of mnp mobile number portability so they can change from geo to airtel or from geo to vodafone idea and so on so depending on the quality of academic delivery and the overall learning orientation of the student the student will be having the mobility and the flexibility of changing the program the institution and the university together now we'll also talk about uh, the other allied dimensions which has been uh, talked about skill development has been a very major emphasis skill development has been very major emphasis and with with academic bank of credit i mean the students can take some break between the academic program and focus on enhancing his or her skill sets now this is providing multiple entry multiple exit for the students the students can uh, store their credits for seven years they can transfer credit through a single window after approval of source and destination academic institution so there are two institutions one the source where he was studying and one is destination where he would like to study so they can uh, transfer the credits from a single window through the digital uh, passbook of academic bank of credits and only the institutions which are verified academic institutions they can upload credits so the institutions which are well structured and they have been doing their required due diligence of the regulatory bodies only those can upload the credits and it enables a transparent mechanism wherein the students will be able to have a glance and look at whatever he has accomplished on an ongoing basis till he gets the degree and he'll have a more flexible approach towards curriculum because the curriculum offers more and more electives to the students on the basis of the taste interest and orientation of the students so that's going to be really now we'll also talk about the multidisciplinary education which is currently being emphasized in a very modest way in our latest new education policy the focus would be more towards creation of multidisciplinary universities and the students would have multidisciplinary education so that they are able to develop all capacities of human beings now when we talk about intellectual aesthetic social physical emotional and moral in an integrated manner so the agenda is to focus on creating world class professionals with multiple multidisciplinary education so that he or she becomes a holistic well grounded well rounded personality having focus on all the aspects whether it's intellectual aesthetic social physical emotional and moral in an integrated manner well we have all read about the concept given by arvindo ghosh who talked about integral education which emphasized on which emphasized on mental physical psychic spiritual and vital all the five dimensions to focus on the holistic development of a student so it's important for us to understand that multidisciplinary education will focus on the 
system wherein the students can learn sciences, technologies, mathematics with liberal arts, humanities, languages, social sciences, professional skills, vocational skills, ethics, morality, human values, and so on at the same time. So it's like a team of people from multidisciplinary, they are focusing on developing a driverless car, then focusing on agricultural technology. So the <clears throat> emphasis is on making education more and more innovative, where the students will get a holistic approach towards education. They have a lot of liberty on choosing what to learn and what not to learn based on their skill orientation and industry expectations. So a lot of flexibility to the students in the times to come. And the focus is more and more on skill development because the policy has envisioned holistic development of the youth. And this will, now, there have been two envisioned targets. For primary education, the target is 100%. And for the higher education domain, the gross enrollment targeted ratio is 50%. So now the importance is gross enrollment ratio has to be 50%, but simultaneously very high emphasis is to be given on imparting the skills. And this is going to be a very key element of our modern education system. And our Honorable Prime Minister is so passionate and focused towards imbibing skills. Whenever he has been going to various, uh, you know, various fairs, whether it is academic fairs, industrial fairs, or maybe even to the handicraft fairs, he's always been talking about skills and skill development of the youth. And he has always been making sure that the regulatory bodies are being given the right set of direction, orientation, and emphasis to focus more and more on skill development of the students, faculty colleagues, as well as other stakeholders to make sure that our Indian students become the right blend of knowledge, skills, and competencies. Now, skill-based education is now going to be the part of higher education. And uh, fortunately, India has two different university, I'm sorry, different uh, ministries. One ministry of education is different, and the other one is ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship is different. What I personally feel that if the integration of these two universities, both the universities work together hand in hand, and we establish one center of skill development and entrepreneurship in every university, in every higher educational institution by concerted efforts of Ministry of Education and Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. It would really go a long, long way towards making the students skilled as well as employable. So, major emphasis has been that, look, skill-based education should not only be focused at IITIs and polytechnics, but it should now be focused by all the higher educational institutions. And let me share with you one backdrop. In UAE, the government made sure that every undergraduate program will have one course on innovation and entrepreneurship, which was implemented by the Indian government also way back in the year 2018. That yes, we should also offer the courses on innovation and entrepreneurship. And most of the Indian state governments are now competing against each other by focusing on startups. So most of the states are having their own startup mission. We have the central government, which has the mission of Startup India. So here is the opportunity to make the students skilled and to make them oriented towards entrepreneurship so that they can apply their skills and create new products and focus on entrepreneurial ventures. Now, the teaching should be more focused on practicals, the hands-on learning, skill-based learning, the research-based training. So it's like the balancing has to be 50-50. To focus on skill development, we have to focus on 50% theory and 50% practical. So in the 50% practical, the students will be compelled, will be required to be in the lab, be in the real-world situation, and they are able to get the required set of skills. Analytical learning, it has to be propagated irrespective of the subject. So all the subjects must have analytical learning approach, and we have to do away with the rote learning approach. Now, major emphasis has been on project-based research training. So every master student would be and should be sent for a project-based research training in the corporate world or in real-life scenario 
to make sure they are able to apply the skills learned at under the knowledge and skills learned at undergraduate and postgraduate level to handle some of the real world problems so problem solving approach project based research training under the guidance of some uh, leading doyans from the corporate world so they are going to really change the process of skill development in the higher educational domain now more and more emphasis is going towards the vocational courses now when we say vocational courses is important for us to understand that yes it is the vocational skills are very very important and if the students they get the vocational skills they'll be skillful and employable by the corporate sector so this is a revived approach now earlier also we had more and more emphasis on skills and vocational education but now more and more emphasis is being given so vocational courses are being revived and the undergraduate vocational courses are now going to be pivotal in producing skilled graduates in tune with industrial revolution 4.0 so we are now making a graduation gradual transition from industry revolution 4.0 to 5.0 and i'm sure the vocational courses are going to bring a paradigm shift in imparting the skills to the students and in, in enhancing the focus and emphasis of skill development to the students now we know that our honorable prime minister has been talking about making atmanirbhar bharat and we can do it by making our youth by imparting them skill based education and by introducing the vocational subjects and trainings at school level too and i'm sure we have all read about uh, the vocational education being recommended at the level of 5th and 6th class in among the schools so that the students are able to get some vocational uh, skills right from the school level so that when they are coming to the college it doesn't sound alien to them and they become more skilled with the optimal uh, blend of life skills vocational skills as well as their domain skills so the nep 2020 it has made sure that the students of the middle level also will be exposed to hands on training in vocational skills like carpentry plumbing electrical repairing horticulture pottery embroidery etc so the agenda is to make sure the students must acquire the skills which can make them employable and make sure that the provi providing vocational skills to at least 50% students by 2025 is very very important and the vocational skills acquired at the school level it can be further extended to the higher education level because whatever he has learnt at the school level he or she can further extend it when he or she reaches the higher education level depending on the requirement of the individual student so skill de development is going to get a lot of emphasis and we know that in 2011 we had the workforce of 477.9 million which increased to 502.4 in 2017 now as per the india skills report we are going to be having 600 million workforce by 2022 imagine 600 million workforce by 2022 just few days after 2021 we are left with hardly few more days left in 2021 so by 2022 we are going to have more skilled workforce of 109 million and they'll be required in 24 key sectors of the economy well uh, let me take you back in the annals of history way back in 2014 15 the so skill development uh, the ministry of skill development in uh, association with fiki and cii it divided various key sectors focused on their uh, skills like there was one bfsi skills banking and financial sector so the key sectors were divided and sector specific councils were made under the chairmanship and ceo of hardcore professionals with accomplished uh, career background so we divided the economy into 24 key sectors to make sure that we take more and more initiatives so that we have more skilled workforce of 109 million in the years to come so the figures are very very intriguing and challenging which india is facing but then we have to make sure that the indian students in the times to come must have the required skills so that they take up the jobs in india and abroad with strong competence and confidence now 
let us understand that employability is increasing especially employability of the skilled workforce has made a quantum move has leapfrogged from 33.95 percent in 14 to 45.6 percent in 2018. so we have seen that if the students are having the required set of skills their employability definitely increases now the key challenge is to talk about the distribution of workforce between unorganized sector and organized sector at eight percent now in the uh, unorganized sector we have 92 percent people in the organized sector we have just eight percent people so gradually by 2022 we'll have 10 percent people in the organized sector and 90 percent in the unorganized sector so it's important for us to make sure that the unorganized sector which is continuing which is going to continue to power the india's skilled workforce demand which will require people with education up to secondary and senior secondary levels they are to be skilled and even non-technical graduates to be skilled in the relevant and focused areas it's important for us to understand as university stakeholders that we will be delivering academic programs with optimal level of focus and emphasis on skills so that the students become employable now we are talking about the skill gaps which are the concerns for the industry we know that the students should have the ability to grow they must have the passion to innovate and apart from this they should have the opportunity to transform the talent they should be able to deliver products and services on time they should meet the quality standards of the institution and of the industry and they have to also make sure that they meet environmental and social requirements and they're able to comply the various rules regulations and guidelines of the industry as well as of the institution together so these are skill gap concerns for industry and we need to focus on incorporating these aspects in the curriculum in the optimal way so that the students are able to accomplish the required skills when they are pursuing the programs well integration of indian languages has also been a key you know defining feature now language i'll at the outset i would like to talk about the fact that aict e has been uh, doing a pioneering work under the dynamic leadership of uh, sastrabuddha sir who has launched the academic programs of technical education in hindi as well so he we think that language should not become a barrier in the process of in the process of academic delivery so when we talk about uh, language should not be a barrier in the process of academic delivery it should help us in terms of making sure that yes the students are able to acquire the knowledge skills and competencies irrespective of their languages now integration of the indian languages we have to pre preserve and promote the indian culture we have to promote the languages and it is to be focused towards making sure that academic programs are being offered in hindi as well as other local languages as well because a uh, very startling uh, data which says that in the last 50 years we have lost 220 languages and unesco has declared 197 indian languages as endangered we need to focus on perpetrating the languages the local languages and making sure that suboptimal knowledge of english as a language should not become a hurdle in the process of the academic accomplishment of the students now when we talk about the indian languages the indian languages will be integrated into a school and higher education at every level and the primary learning has to be done through the mother tongue till class five so we have to be very focused at making sure that the students are to be helped with the learning of the basic languages and the high quality learning materials in form of workbooks textbooks magazines videos poems plays and novels etc are to be created so that the youngsters are able to learn the concepts the basic concepts in their native language so that's how the agenda is of uh, the integration of indian languages and we have to understand that if we are if we are able to focus on you know helping the people in terms of maximizing
interpretation of Indian language, it will be helping them a lot in terms of uh, the students to, who could otherwise not were in a position to learn in the English language. So let us uh, move forward in terms of what have been the other major focus areas of uh, the national education policy or the new education policy which we talk about. So they have to be, the vocabulary in the dictionary has to be enriched so that the students are able to learn their, learn the content of their domain. Now, the platforms, they will be consisting of dictionaries. So we are supposed to be focusing on creation of platforms, which will have cons the dictionaries, the videos, the recordings, people speaking the language, recitation of poetry, telling of stories, and performance of folk songs, plays, dance, etc. So the languages are to be integrated so that the students are able to learn the languages and the web portals will provide them an opportunity to learn the language easily. So people having high level of knowledge of the language, they'll be invited to contribute to the portal and the students will have the option to get their learnings from some top-notch experts without having uh, much of hindrance. Now, these web portals will be managed by the universities and their research team and will be funded by the NRF, National Research Foundation, which is one of the entities envisioned by the, envisioned in the new national education policy. Now, all these languages, we have to be focused at creation of e-courses in major regional languages. And not just we are changing the e-content from Hindi to English, but also e-courses to be developed in Tamil, Telugu, Kannad, Malayalam, Gujarati, Marathi, Uri, and Bengali. So more and more programs in the higher educational domain, they will be using the mother tongue, or they'll also use the local language as medium of instruction, so that the language of instruction should not become a barrier in the process of academic delivery. And the programs may be offered bilingually to enable the students to learn optimally. Now, online and digital education, it has Sultan received... Yes, please. मैं ये कह रहा था कि uh, अगले स्पीकर ऑलरेडी है तो इफ okay. वी कैन नो कंक्लूड एंड एब्सोल्युटली फाइन थैंक यू सो द मेजर एम्फसिस हैज बीन ऑन ऑनलाइन एंड डिजिटल एजुकेशन एंड मिक्स मोड ऑफ डिलीवरी हैज गॉट ऑप्टिमल एम्फसिस एंड विद दिस वर्ड्स आई वुड लाइक टू कंक्लूड माय डिलीवरी थैंक यू वेरी मच वंस अगेन टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड लुक फॉरवर्ड टू फर्दर डिलीवरीशन व्हाट डू यू सर Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Indaji, we can welcome him and uh, request him for his speech. Yeah. Now, my request, Dr. Vikas Gupta, registrar from Delhi University, to please brief the participants. Dr. Vikas Gupta ji, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are yes, audible. Yeah, you are audible. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, friends, and my dear speakers and respected participants. Uh, I think the apt approach to comprise all of us about the national education policy, which was rolled out by the government on 29th July 2020. Though one year has passed, more than one year has passed, but still, uh, what we have observed is that the teachers are still not fully aware of the various aspects of the national education policy. I'm thankful to the previous speaker, Dr. Rana Singh, who has very nicely explained the various aspects related to national education policy. Though he has covered most of the points uh, explaining the outlining details of the national education policy, and if I add certain things to those points raised by uh, Dr. Rana, what I personally feel is, what I personally feel is that if I see this as a document of national education policy, I would not feel that this is only a document. But it is a commitment on the part of the government of India to 
promote the teaching learning process and ultimately in overall aspects of nation building. It is basically revolving around the learner centric do doctrine wherein the transformation of extant education system has been defined, reaffirming it that the students are its main stakeholders and it also specifies that it is the bounden duty of the teachers to create an ecosystem which responds to dreams and aspiration of learners. So if I see the two major aspects of this national education policy, then what I believe is that we have two centric points. The first is the student or the learners, and the second is the trainers or the teachers. And in this national education policy, what all has been amalgamated is that it is going to promote multimodal approaches of learning multimodal approaches of learning we all know that it is a face to face mode of learning which all these years we have practiced and we have all gone through and the second is online and distance or virtual mode now the last almost two years when the covid 19 pandemic has disrupted our life in all spheres but i am thankful to all the teachers and the teaching community that they have saved the precious academic years of the students. How? They have saved by imparting education through the virtual mode. I have also seen that the teachers, there are several teachers who are not even aware how to use the WhatsApp or how to use the latest mobiles or latest technologies. And they themselves have made aware of the various technical developments to impart education. So when I see this document of national education policy, so it is promoting the education in multimodal approaches of learning that is both face to face mode as well as online and distance or virtual mode and ultimately it is combining with now what are the various parameters that national education policy is combining with is the multidisciplinary, the vocational, the value added, skill development and graduate attributes or learning outcome based curriculum it also emphasizes on evaluation evaluation reforms and then ultimately culminating into the academic bank of credits uh, dr rana has very nicely explained the academic bank of credit i would not repeat those things i would only highlight you just read these three words very carefully academic bank and credits And ultimately, here the currency for academics are going to earn or study, deposit them in this bank, and then redeem it wherever it is possible. And through Academic Bank of Credit, multiple entry and multiple exit. When we deposit some things in the bank, a student would be free to come in and go out. So that is another option. Gupta Apart from that, the national education policy is also coupled with the on-demand study and examinations. It is also highlighting the open book examination and group examinations, which we have seen is a great success in the today's scenario. And after the full implementation of NEP, what we believe is that we will ensure enhanced success and now ensure enhanced access we would be able to provide complete flexibility we would be able to have a quality learning we would be 
able to uh, achieve the interest and needs of learners in real worlds of learning. So ultimately, it is going to ensure the freedoms for learners, choose wherein the, the learners, they can choose the courses and the institutions. There would be changing in the pedagogical pathways through mentors, through timing food or learning on demand. So this was the another idea, learning on demand was there. Apart from that, if I see this aspect, then another important aspect of this national education policy is the holistic and multidisciplinary education. How holistic and multidisciplinary education is going to help? What is its aim? Its aim is to develop all capacities of human beings in an integrated manner besides general engagement and enjoyment of learning. And what are the various capacities of human being? They have been highlighted in intellectual, aesthetic, social, physical, emotional, and moral. So ultimately, the national education policy help develop well-rounded individuals possessing critical 21st century capacities in fields across. Now, again, here in the national education policy, the boundaries are being removed across arts, humanities, languages, sciences, social sciences, and professional, technical, and vocational fields. Apart from that, it would also, the, the candidate would also possess the ethics of social engagement and soft skills such as communication, discussion, and debate, and rigorous specialization in a chosen field or fields are concerned. So ultimately, if we see that the holistic and multidisciplinary education is going to, that is why we say it's holistic because we are going to inculcate various aspects. A, a, a student, as an when a student goes to the market, what are the products a student would be getting? And it is a long tradition of holistic and multidisciplinary learning, which is being revived in this national education policy. We all know that there are universities like there were universities like Takshila and Nalanda, which were the pillars of education in the ancient period. So in the ancient Indian list, literary, they describe good education as knowledge of Chonsat Kala or Chonsat Art. We know we are known it as Banabata Kandambari Kadambari. So when we say Kham Sablovane Sunataki by Chonsat Kala me nipun hona chiye, chonsat art ani chiye. तो वो चौसठ आठ का कंसेप्ट क्या था तो चौसठ आठ में बहुत सारी चीजें उन्होंने जोड़ी थी सिंगिंग एंड पेंटिंग एज साइंटिफिक फील्ड्स केमिस्ट्री एंड मैथमेटिक्स वाज बीइंग टॉक टुगेदर वोकेशनल फील्ड्स कारपेंट्री एंड क्लोथ्स मेकिंग अगर अब आप ये वोकेशनल फील्ड की बात करें और थोड़ा सा हमारे टाइम पे जब हम एक सब्जेक्ट पढ़ते थे आजकल के बच्चे भी थोड़ा सब्जेक्ट पढ़ते हैं एक पीरियड होता है एसयूपीडब्ल्यू socially useful productive work us daran hum students ko kai tarike ke topics mein involve karte hain clay modeling mein karte hain photography mein karte hain musical instruments mein karte hain dance mein karte hain to kahin na kahin pe ek unko hum activity aisi karate the ki wo kisi tarike se ek vocational field mein apne aap ko develop kare then it also talks about professional fields like medical and engineering and also talks about soft skills. So, ये देखिए चौसठ कला की जो बात थी, जो उस जमाने में भी थी, जब तक्षिला नलंदा थे, तो वहाँ पे ये सारी चीजें एक तरीके से एक student choose करता था और पढ़ता था। कहीं ना कहीं पे जब हमारी policy develop होती चली गई, हम और technologies पे और education पे depend होते चले गए, तो वो कहीं ना कहीं हमसे चीजें छूटती चली गईं। अब एक तरीके से हमारे को एक रिवाइव करना है हमारे सिस्टम को। We are reviving our system so that we go back to our Indian roots कि जहाँ पे हम overall एक well founded individual बन सकें। तो ultimately ये एक broader concept था education का कि जहाँ पे हम अलग-अलग चीजों को किस तरीके से जोड़ पाएंगे, कैसे देख पाएंगे। इसमें एक कंसेप्ट आ रहा है असेसमेंट ऑफ एजुकेशनल अप्रोचेस इन यूजी एजुकेशन वेयर वी आर गोइंग टू इंटीग्रेट ह्यूमैनिटीज एंड साइंस ह्यूमैनिटीज एंड आर्ट्स विद साइंस टेक्नोलॉजी इंजीनियरिंग एंड मैथमेटिक्स व्हिच इज ब्रॉडली नोन एज स्टेम एस टी ई एम एंड अल्टीमेटली इट इज गोइंग टू इंक्रीज द क्रिएटिविटी एंड इनोवेशन क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग एंड हाई ऑर्डर थिंकिंग कैपेसिटीज अब हमने कुछ समय से अभी देखा कि सीबीएसई ने अपने करिकुलम में चेंजेस लाए जो बोर्ड के पेपर आते हैं उसमें कुछ 
क्वेश्चन उनके क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग और या हायर ऑर्डर थिंकिंग कैपेसिटीज के या कैपेबिलिटीज के आते हैं सो वी आर गोइंग टू इन्वॉल्व दीज कंसेप्ट इन अवर हायर एजुकेशन ऑल्सो प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग एबिलिटीज एज ए टीम वर्क अभी तक स्टूडेंट्स इंडिविजुअली पढ़ते थे बट हेयर वी वॉन्ट टू इन्वॉल्व दैम एज ए टीम फॉर लर्नर्स देन कम्युनिकेशन स्किल्स more in depth learning and mastery of curricula across fields and increases in social and moral moral awareness and other activities of the life imaginative and flexible curricular structures enable creative combinations of disciplines for studies offer multiple entry and exit points creating new possibilities for lifelong learning and education in large multidisciplinary universities apart from that it is also planned to stimulate indian education environment by establishing various departments dr rana has very nicely explained these aspects but i would just brief them that what are the various de departments that has been envisaged to be established to revive the indian education and environment is languages literature music philosophy indology art dance theater and accommodation and many more subjects which we are going to establish as a departments and it has been planned that whatever the students are going to learn they are going to get the credits for each and everything they are going to learn so ultimately there is a move to uh, move so that we can move forward or towards higher quality and holistic and multidisciplinary education wherein the curricula will be flexible flexible and innovative curricula would be there the students would be asked to carry out projects in the areas community engagement and services and environmental education when we talk about environmental education education we so climate change pollution waste management sanitation conservation of biological diversity management of biological resources and biodiversity forest and wildlife conservation and sustainable development and living so all these topics they are going to cover under the ambit of the conservation they have also talked about the value based education development of humanistic ethical constitutional and universal human value of truth that is what we call as satya righteous conduct dharma peace shanti love lessons for service and participation in community service programs will be considered an integral part of holistic education so when we say all these things and uh, i would not take you much far yesterday there was an article in a hindi newspaper ki that uh, mnit prayagraj earlier the alabad they are going to teach in their engineering curriculum ultimately they are going to bring the students uh, together or closer to the real life real life in what sense ki humne ramayan mein padha tha pushpak viman ke bare mein to pushpak viman kya tha usko reality के साथ पहले जब महाभारत में युद्ध हुआ तो जो हमारे हमारी साइंस कितनी डेवलप थी उस टाइम की और वैदिक साइंस कितनी डेवलप थी वैदिक मैथमेटिक्स कितना डेवलप था हमारा उन चीजों को रियलिटी में लाके आगे डेवलप करने की बहुत जरूरत है आज की परिस्थिति में देखिए कि आज के दिन लूनर एंड अदर तो कहीं ना कहीं पे एक डेवलपमेंट डेवलप्ड साइंस थी सो वेन वी आर ट्राइंग टू रिवाइव एवरी थिंग एंड वेन वी आर ट्राइंग टू ब्रिंग अवर स्टूडेंट क्लोजर टू द रियल टॉपिक्स दैट इज दल्टीमेट कंसेप्ट ऑफ द नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी तो बहुत ज्यादा मैं समय नहीं लेता हुआ आप लोगों को I convey my sincere thanks that the organizers organizers have taken the right topic to choose about the various aspects 
ऑफ नेशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी इसके अंदर करिकुलम रिफॉर्म भी बहुत ज्यादा तरीके से ला रहे हैं जैसे अंडर ग्रेजुएट प्रोग्राम पे हम तीन साल का प्रोग्राम भी पढ़ेंगे हम चार साल का भी प्रोग्राम पढ़ेंगे अब जैसे दिल्ली विश्वविद्यालय की जो एग्जीक्यूटिव काउंसिल है उसने ऑनर्स प्रोग्राम तीन साल का भी रखा है उसने ऑनर्स प्रोग्राम चार साल का भी रखा है कि बच्चा ये डिप्राइव ना हो कि मेरा ऑनर्स डिग्री हो सकती है और का जो पीजी करिकुलम है वो भी हम डेवलप कर रहे हैं कि एक साल का भी होगा पीजी पी, दो साल का भी हो सकता है कि बच्चों को लगे मैं चार साल यहाँ पढ़ लिया तो पीजी में दो साल की पढ़ के मैं क्यों नुकसान करूँ तो वो अलग अलग कॉम्बिनेशन के साथ तो गवर्नमेंट ने इतनी फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी दी है इसके लिए कि कौन तीन साल का प्रोग्राम कर सकता है कौन चार साल का कर सकता है कौन साल का ऑनर्स करके ले जाएगा कौन चार साल का ऑनर्स लेगा कौन मास्टर डिग्री एक साल की लेगा कौन मास्टर डिग्री दो साल की लेगा और अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट देर इज अ फोकस ऑन रिसर्च एंड इनोवेशन एंड द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग देशनल एजुकेशन पॉलिसी हैज ऑल्सो टॉक्ड अबाउट दिनारे ऑफ एपिडेमिक्स एंड पैंडेमिक्स ऑल्सो कि what they have emphasized that it is critical to undertake lead in research in areas of infectious disease epidemiology virology diagnostics instrumentation vaccinology and other relevant areas develop scientific hand holding mechanism and competitions for promoting innovations national research foundation is being established to support vibrant research and innovative culture so this is the ultimate concept of the national education policy and with these words i convey my sincere thanks to my colleagues who have given me an opportunity to be part of this platform if there are any queries or any concern i am there to answer that right now thank you so much uh, thank you sir for sharing your vast wisdom and knowledge with us especially in terms of NEP 2020 we are hopeful that all the participants and especially we are also benefited by your vast experience uh, before moving to the question answer session uh, i'd like to request dr jagannath patil's advisor nak to please briefly highlight uh, the remaining part of NEP 2020 uh, patil sir please ji uh, thank you very much uh, i think um, previous speaker dr rana singh ji and vikas gupta ji have covered all the important aspects that we wanted to discuss today i'll just take a few minutes uh, indra ji can you hear me yes sir yeah yes sir you are out sir sir so i just wanted to say a few words rather uh about the six parameter that nac is uh, making an attempt to incorporate in assessment and accreditation framework uh these parameters are now uh, clubbed under the new heading called institutional preparedness for nep 2020 and uh, from 1st december 2021 they are now already part of the assessment and accreditation process of all categories of uh, manuals that nac has we have uh, uh, manuals for universities autonomous colleges affiliated colleges health science institutions yoga institutions law institutions uh, and various types of institutions including sanskrit also so for all those institutions now uh, we uh, have made this component called institutional preparedness for nep as a mandatory component but it is part of a profile it means this part is not going to be evaluated right now but we are seeking inputs from the institutions as to what kind of so multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach is first part of this and we are seeking from institutions what kind of vision they have developed to transform itself into holistic multidisciplinary institutions and so on there are such five to six parameters you can see Uh, another important topic that we are discussing uh, is about academic bank of credits uh, we know that this is one part of nep which is already being implemented it means the ugc has already set up the academic bank of credits honorable prime minister inaugurated it uh, uh, sometimes back and institutions are now enrolling to be part of this academic bank of credits 
and we are asking institutions what steps they are taking to be part of the ABC so that institutional mobility of the students can be promoted. Skill development has been discussed thoroughly, so we are asking questions about skill development and also about integration of Indian knowledge system, teaching in Indian language, culture, and other online courseworks. So this is also being asked. Another important component that we are seeking information from institutions uh, about the component that is uh, reflected in NEP about, is about outcomes-based education. So institutions initiatives to transform its curriculum towards outcome-based education uh, that will be uh, reflected in the uh, self-study reports that institutions are preparing now for NACS assessment. And the last component is about uh, distance education and online education. We have seen during Corona period that you know it has come as a savior. The online education came to us as a savior during the pandemic period. We couldn't uh, otherwise, as the Guttaji was saying, it could have uh, created a, a large discontent and disconnect within the academic community, but online education through various modes has saved us. And now it will be a uh, uh, very important feature of the all types of education. May it is, uh, you know, higher education or even secondary education. This uh, blended education, online plus offline education will be important. So what it, uh, efforts are being made by institution is another uh, important uh, criteria that NAC is seeking information. Uh, so these are the few criteria. So I, I uh, don't want to make entire presentation that I wanted to do uh, because we are just reaching our this probable closing time that is one o'clock now. But we can definitely benefit from the uh, presence of two eminent experts. They are here today. And so if the participants have any doubts, queries, they can raise so. So I'm going to stop here. Indaji, let us have some questions and answers. Thank you, sir. I know that the participants, they would be having a lot of queries. So my kindly request the ICT team also to felicitate the question answer session. There is a kind request to the participants. You can unmute yourself one by one and ask the questions. There are panelists and experts from MAC to reply to your queries. Uh, Usha, are you there? The participants, you can unmute uh, one by one or you can raise the hand. There is an option of raise hands. Uh, we'll uh, let you know. There is a question in chat box. What is the eligibility criteria to register for academic bank of credit? Ranaji, Patil, sir. Yes, please. Well, to get registered for the academic bank of credits, well, there has been a prerequisite that the institution especially the higher educational universities which have the rights to grant degrees and they have uh, they have the process of incubation like those universities have been established either by the state government or by the central government or they have been granted the status as deemed university or they are institution of national importance so all these universities which have degree granting rights or other institutions which have diploma granting rights, they will be the ones who will be eligible to be part of the academic bank of credits to upload their credits. So it's like institutions and universities which have been legally empowered by state government, central government or other regulatory bodies to grant degrees or diplomas will be the ones who will be eligible to be part of academic bank of credits and would be eligible to upload the credits. Thank you, sir. There is second uh, question. Sir, what are the market? Don't, you know, in this entire uh, ABC it has a dedicated website created by UGC, and also uh, you know all the aspects uh, of eligibility will be there on the website. You can have a look at that. But my understanding is that uh, university needs to have NAC accreditation also in order to be able to join this. So there are various uh, criteria that you can 
see maybe we can give a link here uh, or you can just google the academic bank of credit you will see that uh, you you will reach the website created by abc by the ugc thank you participants uh, participants if you have any queries you may kindly unmute yourself and ask the query uh, good afternoon sir myself dr bhavna bajpay may i ask one question uh, sir agar jaise for example agar jin organizations ko ya universities ko abhi 3 saal hue hain abhi wo nac ke procedure ke liye nahi gaye hain to kya wo eligible honge is they are eligible for uh, abc as of now my knowledge is that you need to have a uh, nac accreditation to be able to join the abc by the institute <coughs> thank you sir thank you so much any other participants please थैंकफुल to the key resource persons today dr rana singh ji the vice chancellor from sanskrit university and dr vikas gupta the registrar from delhi university i know both of you are very occupied still you have taken the time out and accept our invitation to be the keynote speaker and the guest of honor very equally thankful to the northern region special dr jagannath patil sir advisor ma'am dr pratibha sin madam deputy advisor dr vinita sau assistant advisor especially to sir for constantly guiding us and making this program successful we are thankful to the ict team professor amya kumar rath advisor nay dr uh, mr samuel pushya lakshmi also to providing us the technical help also and last but not the least we are thankful again to the participants and we hope such future cooperations for webinars or seminars that will be organizing thank you one and all so can we close the program patil sir yes ji ji namaskar thank you rana singh ji thank you gupta ji once again Thank you sir. Forward to be in touch with you. Thank you everyone. Thank you sir. Thank you so much. Thanks all of you.